The question that I'd like to share with you guys today is this one. How do we actually demonstrate that our architectures are ready? And this is quite of a hard thing to ask, but we need to define it a little bit. When I say demonstrate, not necessarily prove, because we know that proving things is hard, so let's start with demonstrating, even if to ourselves, which is probably easier. And ready is a bit abstract in how well you define it, like what is production, it's the product release, this kind of thing. And when you think about this, the usual answers that we discuss are like, well, we are using a popular stack like LAMP or Main, or we are using Netflix open source, so we expect to have some degree of success. Or if you're in a large enterprise, you may be compliant with this GDPR or ISO or SOC or PCI or whatever compliance standard that you're dealing with. Or even better, if you're most technical, as we are all, you have testing. And having tests is great. You do your load testing, your performance testing, your unit tests, or all your automated testing suits. And I don't know about you guys, but in my experience, every project that I worked most stopped at this point. Like, test what you can and pray for the best, right? And that's sometimes enough, sometimes not enough, because how do you know if you're testing enough, if your architecture is ready? All these people doing this amazing stuff on their architectures, and we are kind of left with this amount of legacy. And the, solving this problem is a bit hard. So I work a lot with customers to change the way they think about architecture, instead of doing this subjective um, and qualitative, ephemeral understanding of the architecture, I think we need to change a bit the way architectures are assessed. First, first of all, instead of trying to optimize for the specific case, such as performance, and trying to squeeze every millisecond there, trying to satisfy, it's like, what are your specific throughput, latency, or whatever other requirement that you can as objective, uh, objectively as possible, making it quantitative. And a lot of those decisions are usually lost, so trying to make it durable and shared with the rest of the team, if only, if not, to the software community in general. So, and this has a lot of different answers. At Amazon, the way we do it is the well-architected framework, and this is the only reference I'll have to my employer in this talk. This is the way we measure things and determine architecture readiness in this well-architected framework. But the important thing is the idea behind the framework. We use security, reliability, performance, costs, and operations as non-functional requirements, but you could pick your own requirements or extend this list. This is uh, just a set of questions, and uh, we are trying to see why they're important. So starting with security, um, I want to show you and talk about the most important things customers are doing in each of those areas and that um, I've been involved. Security automation is first and foremost, because today um, the, there is not this hacker man figure that are attacking systems and this group. It's an automation battle. If you think that someone is hacking your system, it's not like this. Um, cinema show, uh, or as we see in the series, people hacking stuff, it's automated. When WannaCry devastated the, the internet last year, it was four days. And in the first day, it was more than uh, 300,000 um, infections. So this is really, really hard. And getting security right is most difficult because identity management and encryption changed a lot in the recent years. Um, used it to be the case that encryption is hard and expensive, but now it's free and integrated and everybody can do it. But key management is really hard. Like, uh, I like to pick this, uh, the, this case because if you think about 
Uh, as administrators, we probably have access to a lot of data that we shouldn't. Like, how do you protect, for example, health information from developers, from system administrators, and from uh, all other malicious intents, of course, but really, truly protecting and proving, demonstrating that this data is protected is, is really, really hard. And one part of answering this question, and a very significant part, is log analytics. Because um, sometimes one person accessing one customer record is not a problem, but one employee accessing every um, customer address perhaps is something more uh, indicative of a problem. So doing this log analytics not as a report, not as something by the end of the month, as an audit, but doing this live is pretty important these days. And it's changing a lot uh, with our architectures. When we talk about serverless, we have a lot of people and an important discussion about what is left to protect when you don't have servers anymore. OK, we don't need patching, but can my application have a denial of service attack? And what is my role um, as a function? Is, uh, is this a role of the function, a role of the provider? Something shared? What are the boundaries? Uh, who's going to take care of not only the application security, but you have to think of all the dependencies, libraries, and frameworks, and how to make this safe is, um, is a pretty hard call. And many customers are turning to machine learning to do that. So in predictive systems operations, we have crawlers running through data and trying to determine what is personally identifiable information that should have very strict access controls and when those data were accessed and things like this. So mix and matching and reporting them is very important because you need to be very proactive about some of these kinds of data and this because or else it could be uh, really bad in terms of business viability. After you have an incident with these kinds of data, sometimes you don't have a, a second chance and having a prepared, established, and possibly automated answer to this is crucial for lots and lots of business. And this is not only for security. We talk about data security in a general sense, but uh, reliability is also a, a very important business criteria that we can demonstrate and measure and automate with similar tools and, and criteria. For example, this is um, an exercise from Netflix. And this is a lot of traffic. Netflix currently has millions of users across the world. It's estimated that nearly 40% of the internet goes through the systems. And you can see that as the error rate goes up, uh, those are the three regions that they operate in the US. And they have an error rate, for example, a de bad deployment somewhere. They can replicate traffic and redistribute traffic from one region to another until they can have enough scale on the other regions until everything is scaled out so they can switch the, the DNS, fail over and recover the, the bad region and then automate the, the fail back uh, in the same fashion. And this is an ex Extremely simple visualization using Visceral, their open source tool, but you can think of the amount of automation that goes behind uh, the magic of making this happen. And this is due to this, I uh, highly recommend the Simeon Army. You have tools to kill one instance, one data center, one entire region, and make sure that your resources are still available. And and this, again, at Netflix, they run approximately 500 microservices. And this is not just to go with the microservices trend, but it's not about scaling the software. It's about scaling the organization. And this is why we had it uh, for a while now. And it's important to understand that it's a process. It's not something that you can just cut from one day to the other. We need to 
slowly uh, queue, introduce uh, routers to be able to split this traffic like this and this ability to manage traffic and monitor what's going on with uh, tools as just like we just saw with AJ Proxy and similar tools, you can slowly move to this microservices world when we have been operating it for uh, a, a few years. And, and if there's a lot that must go on so you can enjoy microservices and live in this world, one, that, one thing that you can't live without is infrastructure as code. If you're deploying uh, 500 services in three different regions, it's at least uh, 1,500 deployments right there. So um, if this is not completely encoded and automated, it's um, totally unmanageable. And I wish we had more time to talk about uh, infrastructure as code and the patterns and tools for that. But if you'd like to dive deeper on this, I'm the author of the white paper on the Amazon website. So take a look at that. And I would be happy to continue to talk with you guys on this subject. But I have to share some things about performance, because after we have a secure and reliable website, we want to make it fast, right? And the performance things that we have in mind, certainly as I have in mind, have been changing a lot and changing fast. We see in the cloud we have stuff such as 128 gigs of memory, uh, 128 vCPUs on a single box. Uh, this is a huge enabler for HPC and all other sorts of um, big data and compute with four terabytes of RAM, of four terabytes of memory in a single box. The, I'm from one time that four terabyte was called big data, and now it fits in memory. And it's very important to see how this is changing the things that can be built on top of this things. And if you're not CPU intensive or memory intensive, perhaps you're disk intensive. And we were talking about uh, things such as NVMe and disk advances that combined can give you huge throughput and change a lot of what we are doing. And with other components as well, such as high-end uh, GPUs, such as NVIDIA, and even field programmable gate arrays that are now available for deployment in the cloud, even being such uh, hardware focused resources. But some of us really care about this when we are tuning the milliseconds and microseconds out of the performance, but that's not necessary. Some of us have containers where you just specify how much memory and how much CPU you need and go, or perhaps sometimes just serverless, where you just say the, the memory and CPU is inferred from that and this kind of thing. So the important thing is not one or another, but having this mechanical sympathy to understand when you need functions, when you need containers, when you need servers. And a, a most complex production environments are probably going to use a combination of those as appropriate especially because costs, there's a lot of costs implications to this. You have to think not only about the costs of compute, the cost of network, the cost of not hitting your cache on your CDN, because the, and this can save you a lot of money just on the, on the first year. So seeing the, the, your architecture and removing uh, or tuning the right component at the right part is really beneficial. In our case, with the CDN and with uh, flexible compute models, you can, just by understanding a bit um, uh, the performance models that your cloud provider offers, there is certainly a lot of money right there on the table. And for a huge example of this is serverless. And this is Lynn Langett. She shows in her talk that uh, a huge project that costed $9 million for the Australian government, was rebuilt uh, with functions on the cloud with this kind of innovation for like $500. So the innovation and perspectives that we are seeing in this space are gigantic in terms of opportunities. And on the terms of operational improvements that you can make in your software development process, 
Uh, the thing that I find most important recently is this lightweight architecture records, uh, a technique to keep this in text files structured in your repo under a shared version control so everybody can learn and understand why those decisions were made, when they were made, and what goal they achieved, so you can demonstrate the benefits that you had and why you took the decisions you took. And this can be hugely valuable to future members of your project. Because in the end, the cloud is a truly uh, democratizing force, we put a lot of cool technology in the hands of everyone, but it's not just as useful if you don't have the understanding of what problems this solves and how, and technically and objectively how you can apply this. We are not here just to talk about uh, wide concepts and try to put things into boxes and infantilizing the solutions. I think it's really important to go beyond those little boxes and trying to put some numbers onto those requirements and build a lot of great stuff as you guys are doing worldwide, but this is not uh, the same everywhere. I'm, I'm from this... Uh, I really like this case, but uh, in the, I'm from the country in red right there, so I'm allowed to make one closing joke that uh, although you see this evolution of the cloud and the greatest products that we are building, in some places it still looks like that. So we need to be more sharing of these decisions and more sharing of those requirements and how do we comply and how do we build great software so that everybody can do the same. And that's it, thank you so much.